All right. Uh, no idea if uh, <laughs> if people can can see or hear me. Um, I'll try and keep my eyes on the chat. But welcome, if you can, and if you are, uh, to this this third stream. Uh, today we're going to be doing a little bit more uh, a little bit more work on the bus pirate. And of course, the bus pirate is uh, this nice uh, hardware hacking slash reverse engineering slash debugging tool um, by Dangerous Prototypes, uh, which we've been working on for the last couple of weeks in uh, well on these streams to to basically create uh, a driver uh, in TypeScript, not only for the bus pirate itself so that we can talk to it and control its modes and everything from TypeScript, but also so that we can talk through the bus pirate over the various um, protocols that it allows us to speak. So uh, the bus pirate allows us to talk to devices that are on like the SPI bus or the I2C bus or uh, it allows us to just control the pins directly and toggle them on and off. It also allows for a couple more protocols like uh, one wire. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what we've been working on is getting the the SPI up and running and testing that out with um, testing that out with uh, a specific device. And that device, um, we've got it wired up here sort of on a bunch of test clips, but I'll, I'll show it here for you. Um, that device is a tiny little flash memory chip. It's a spy, spy flash memory chip. Let me see if I can get the camera to focus. If I maybe block some of the stuff behind it. No, this camera is a nightmare for focus. Um, yeah, so it's a little SPI flash chip, which basically means it, uh, it speaks this protocol, SPI. Um, and we can talk to it over the bus pirate and we send it commands and it sends us stuff back. And last week we managed to get to the point <laughs> where it actually, uh, we sent some data and it we were able to get some back. And it was only a byte that we were able to send and receive, but we actually, uh, we actually got that correct byte back. Um, after the stream, I, well, a couple of days later, I dug into the code and I tried to figure out what was going wrong and like why it really messed up. I mean, the core reason was um, that there is something in the bus pirate. Um, there's a command that I implemented in the bus pirate driver for SPI, which allows you to like write a command and some data and then receive a whole bunch of data. And it's intended for things like flash memory chips or uh, EE proms, that kind of stuff, um, because they have data uh, timings uh, that they need to adhere to. Um, and the idea is that you buffer the data up and send it all at once. Well, when I was using that, nothing was happening, basically. It just wasn't working correctly, and I haven't been able to get that to work correctly. And today, what I hope is that we can even like uh, do some debugging on that because I got something uh, in the post today or not today actually a couple of days ago but this will be really the first time using it and that is this uh, beautiful thing inside this uh, this case which is a Salier logic analyzer um, now uh, Patreon and longtime friend of the channel, uh, Max Star, actually uh, let me know that this, um, that there was a kind of uh, di possible discount for um, for certain groups uh, to get this device because it's quite an expensive device. Uh, otherwise, uh, but yeah, so Max put me on to the fact that there's a pretty good substantial discount that you can get. Um, if you meet certain criteria, so I applied for it. I got it. I bought the device and uh, now I have it and it's pretty cool um, It's a logic analyzer. So what it means is it's it's got a bunch of, uh, of little ports there. Oh, it's gonna be it's Impossible for you to see this It's got a bunch of little ports there and you can plug some wires into those and then you can hook those up to to things on like the flash chip 
for instance, and you can read the traffic as it's going by. It's like a tiny digital oscilloscope, kind of. Not really, but it's along those lines. And actually it kind of is because it has analog measurement modes and everything, but it can't uh, handle the full sort of signal range that uh, an oscilloscope can. But the great thing about this is that it all the all the real magic happens in software. So I can actually show you the signals that I couldn't show in one of those earlier streams. And that is actually, uh, yeah, I did manage to get it indeed. It's super cool. I'm super happy with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so let's play around with it. We can actually use this today to figure out what the difference is between like when I just transfer some data to the device and ask like to write 256 uh, uh, bytes, for example, and when we use the Bus Pirate API, I want to see what the difference is, like what what is actually going on between those two things. So that that will be uh, that will be a part of that. Um, so let's just uh, let's just get started. Actually, um, if I go into the code, we'll see where I was last time. This is the message I just sent out on Twitter. Um, so yeah, this is kind of what I wanted to to cover today. It's, I think it's going to be a relatively relaxed stream. I'm not trying to achieve too much. I, I tried too too hard last time, and I'm going to take it a bit easier today. So I want to clean some stuff up and just kind of make the actual flash driver a little bit nicer and a little bit more organized. Uh, maybe want to add a couple more commands just for the sake of it. I think... Uh, I'm not going to go down the road of writing a full, uh, a full crazy every feature driver for this, and 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 like blocking certain, uh, like blocking writes and reads to certain areas and that kind of stuff. Because although it's useful to do, it's not like you know, it's not the main point. I think it would be nice to save a you know a big substantial amount of data to the to the chip and read it back and like perform you know analysis and make sure that every block, every page that we read is uh, is valid. And yeah, let's try and solve the mystery of the write then read with the bus pirate. All right, so in the flash code, it kind of looks like this at the moment. I'm trying to think what's what's different to when uh, when I last when we were looking at this together before. Uh, well, one thing is the reading of the status registers. <laughs> that was a an easy fix. So it turns out. Um, uh, we were trying to read the status registers last time and we were just getting junk data every time. And the problem was that we sent out a request to read, but we didn't send like send a dummy byte in order to read the actual response back. Um, so that is kind of taken care of in, in this. This is pretty, uh, makes that pretty straightforward. I want to get rid of all these magic numbers, right? We have all of these like random... 0, 05, 35, you know, all these kind of things around here. What I want to do is I want to make a bunch of constants for those. Um, so the code is more expressive. And this is what you would do if you were writing a driver for a microcontroller or if you're writing a driver here. I think it's nice to actually give that some semantic meaning. So we can just go back to the, uh, the data sheet, for instance, and we can look at all these commands that we have. Um, for example, the first thing that we do is we enable reset and then reset. Well, we can give those names. So let's do that. Let's put that over there so it's out of the way. So let's have const. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I think, what am I going to call this? All right, let's call it wb for win bond spy enable reset. And I think I'm just going to prefix every uh, every command with this WB SPI, so it's kind of clear what it is. And in order to enable, we have to send 66. So we can already replace that magic number. Great typing skills here. Uh, WB enable reset, then we can actually get rid of the comment because it's not really necessary anymore because the code speaks for itself. And then we're going to have actually reset, which is 99. So let's change that there. 
don't need the comment. Um, all right, what else do we have? We have this read bytes. Uh, we're sending this um, three command and that three is actually the read data command. So, which makes sense, right? <laughs> wb spi read data three. I think this makes things so much clearer, right? You're just replacing the these these uh, things that don't really mean much on their own with um, with meaningful names, and they it starts to kind of um, just bring clarity to the whole thing. And yeah, this needs to go back there. I'm just trying to reformat on the fly as well. Um, okay, so read bytes, then we have read status registers. So we have, uh, I actually wanna really copy the names that they have here in the data sheet. So we have read status register one, read status reg, one and to read that it's zero five and to read register two it's going to be 35 so and what we can do is have a spi this is just in general spi dummy byte we can always send uh, ff and then those are a little bit clearer as well. It's not exactly like a super beautiful code there, but um, can live with it. Oh, Nate, this is the the moment that I should uh, give you give you uh, control. <laughs> Let me do that. Okay, Nate, you are officially the. Uh, the stream moderator, so you can feel free to remove the uh, the the spammers. Uh, write bytes. Okay, so writing bytes is uh, zero two. So, and that is zero two command is actually um, page program. That's what they call it here, which is a tricky name, but I guess I guess I'll go with it. So we do SBI page program. Okay, so that just replaces that. Um, setting the status registers. So we do a transfer. Huh, well this was never gonna work. <laughs> It's amazing what uh, what happens when you come back and look, but yeah, this was never ever gonna work. I didn't even notice this last time. We're not even uh, sending the command, uh, the command byte here. So in order to set the status register, how do we do that? Um, write status register. So we have to send a one. So let's put that in up here already. We'll organize these according to the according to their um, numerical value, maybe, or just the value that they appear in the data sheet. But yeah, this one was never going to work, so that's good just to to get that going. Um, enable write. Uh, so what was that? That was zero six. Zero six. Here is just write enable. Let's collapse that as well. Just chucking these anywhere for now, but we'll actually go and organize them at some moment. So enable write, write enable. 
uh, disable right. I guess that's going to be disable. Uh, so we have right enable, right disable, yep. Right disable is four. Then we have the get jdeck. Nine F, yep. So again, I'll just call it what the thing calls it, which is jdeck ID. One of the other things I want to do here is on startup, I think it would be a good idea to to actually um, read the JDEC ID and like kind of ensure that it matches what we think it should match. Um, because this information is in the data sheet, right? We're, we're writing now a driver that is specific to this chip, right? We're not making a general purpose driver at this point, although I'm pretty sure like a fair bit of this probably could be um, common across chips, but I don't uh, I don't know for sure, so I don't know what is uh, usable. But what, what we can do is we can perform the regular SPI initialization, uh, enable power to the spy device, which we do with the set power API. We send the resets and then we can um, so the J deck uh, ID is the expected value uh, because if it's not going to work at this point, then we could just error out, right? Like we didn't read the device ID as expected. Something went wrong along the way. So, you know, uh, you can't really expect more to, to happen here. So, Let's uh, let's rename this to be get jdeck. I'm just calling this thing jdeck now. I'm not sure if that's the actual pronunciation, but it feels easier than saying jedec -E each time. Um, so we'll get that, and then we will assert that uh, if not jdeck1, and I need to scroll back to see what it should be. So the first byte is this EF byte that says that it's a Winborn chip. So OX EF. And the second byte, uh, what was it? It was 4017, 4017. Zero. All of these numbers in hexadecimal, obviously. Okay, so if this, if these aren't equal, if all of the, if like it's not that every one of these bytes is equal, then we can just throw new error unexpected uh, JDEC response from device, and then maybe we can just print the buffer. Um, We do it like this. Mm. Mm. Are you able to map into a? No, we can't do that. So let's just. Hmm. Yeah, let's just print uh, print the bytes out in decimal for now. Um, we're missing here. There we go. Okay, so in uh, in able in order to do this, I actually have to wire this back up because I took the um, I took the the cables out to clear my desk up a bit so I need to just wire this up so bear with me for a moment because I have to plug in what is it like seven cables here so power uh, ground they're always easy ones 
power on ground. Then what do we have here? This is the uh, data in. So that is Mosey. And then we have clock is my green wire. I know this is like thrilling, by the way. Um, clock, so that's going here. Then the blue wire is the data out. So that's going to be meso. Alert the soup. And this is gonna be chip select. All right, so when that's all wired up, you get this nice spidery situation going on. Cool. All right, so let's go back to the code. Let's plug in the bus pirate. Double check my wiring quickly. Ground, three volt. Yeah, if I got the wiring on the SPI bus wrong, that's actually not that big of a problem at all. Um, but it just wouldn't work correctly. But if I got the, uh, the power and everything mixed up, then that can be uh, a big problem. Uh, all right, so let's try to run the flash. TS node source, oh no, it's in flash example. Yeah, so that actually looks good. So I don't know if you can see this. Um, it did the initialization okay, right? So it did the whole check uh, and everything we passed through in it. And then the main little program that I'm running down here, what it's doing is, well, it's grabbing the, the JDEC, it's printing it. That's what we see here, EF4017. Um, and what we're actually doing is we're taking uh, the page address zero, which is starting with the first page. Uh, and a page is 256 bytes on this chip. So you can read and write 256 bytes at a time. Um, and you can erase actually bigger blocks than that because erasing is obviously an important part, but uh, that's not, we don't have any of that implemented. So what we're doing is we're creating a buffer which just has the numbers from zero to 255 in order. Um, we enable write, we write the bytes uh, at the page address and we send this buffer. And then what we do immediately afterwards is we receive the same bytes. So we just read bytes from the page address, reading 256 bytes, right? And then we print them back to the screen. Which one is the first video in the series? Yeah, the first one, uh, I don't remember what the name of the video is. Um, I can actually check that super quickly. The name of the video is Bus, uh, the first one is called Bus Pirate Integration with TypeScript and JavaScript. But that is, um, that doesn't cover the SPI part. That just covers the initial part of the driver that I was writing. We did some things with PWM then. It's quite an interesting one, I think, <laughs> personally. Uh, the, second ep the second video is the one that talks about SPI Flash. Um, that's where we did the majority of the the work and the debugging uh, on this first part. And yeah, well now you're watching the first, uh, the last one. So <laughs> here we are. Um, yeah, so as you can see, when we read these bytes back, they look like they're coming through, right? It looks like zero, one, two, three, four onwards. Now the problem could be that some signal noise happens on the electrical lines or some glitch, some like not enough power on the line so we glitched or something like that and it might be that we didn't actually write this properly that there's like a bit flipped somewhere so one of the things we we could do and probably should do is like test if these two buffers um are equal and i think i'm going to do that i think that would be a nice like sanity check um and what we might want to do is make a uh like we might want to make a flash read bytes and validate so basically like check that we got the things we, we thought we did. But let's, um, let's just perform a little check here. So like for um, 
starting uh, the first byte while we are less than the two send buffer dot length um, i plus plus and then if uh, the two send buffer at i is not equal to the rx buffer the receive buffer at i then throw new error expected uh, value uh, to send buffer i at uh, offset um, address and the address well, let's print it in hex to be like a, I'm just going to do it I can't, I'm going to write this function that I've written 10 billion times now uh, <laughs> take a hex number and um, take that number n two string 16 <laughs> pad the start up to l with zeros okay and now we can actually print this in hex easily which is what i was avoiding doing it earlier as well uh, the address um is going to be the what's it going to be it's going to be the in this case it's going to be just zero right the page offset page address plus i um but uh but yeah maybe we'll change some things around here and just check that writing to different parts of the flash still works um thanks nate that's awesome yeah like dropping a link actually makes sense uh we expected this value at this address but got and that's going to be the two hex rx buffer at i Uh, cool, right? We're gonna see an error there. Otherwise, the bytes are gonna are gonna match. Um, all right, so let's just run it again. Yes, this can happen. Um, my reset sequence for the bus pirate. It's based on some crazy stuff you have to do. Like this device. I would argue that they. They, they missed there's something missing in this firmware which is like there is no sane way of checking if you're already like the bus pirate is already on and which mode it's in um there are some crazy things it seems like you can do but uh they're not really reliable so the best way is just turn the device off and turn it back on again uh so let's do this yeah, so the fact that we printed the buffer out means that everything read back okay. That's actually really cool. What I want to try maybe now to do is to... I think if we write, if we do write bytes, and I need to check this um, in the... Uh, need to check this in the data sheet. When we do page program, I think if we end up writing more than 256 bits uh, bytes, we end up wrapping back around. And so we need to do individual transactions kind of uh, in that case. Okay, so one byte must be written, um, up to 256 bytes can be written. If you write more, then the addressing will wrap around to the beginning and overwrite the previously sent data. So if we, if we wanna send more than 256 bytes, then we need to do it in, in stages. Um, I think it would be cool just to like send like something else, um, like store something on the device and then like retrieve it back. So like, I don't know, how many bytes is the TS config? I think I was looking at doing this last time or the package JSON. Um, word count character of package JSON is 395 so we should be able to store that pretty straightforwardly straightforwardly um all right so let's import star as fs from fs slash promises so we can read from the file system all right so let's 
uh, instead of that being our to send buffer. And let's write this somewhere else on the, like write this somewhere else, some other like place in the device and check that things work. So let's take a look here. Uh, there's a memory map somewhere and that memory map is quite useful. Um, yeah, this is the one I'm thinking of. So um, security registers one to three, they actually live in memory. So they, they are memory mapped. So in that case, um, they actually take up a full, like a full page, each of those. That's interesting. And this is also interesting because it says that this is the SFDP register and that is in the first page. So I actually don't know what the SFDP register is. This is kind of uh, interesting to take a look at. Um, read SFDP register. Is it just one byte? Because it looks like we we issue this command, we have to send two zeros, then we send an address. Oh yeah, so it's it's something in the first page, but I don't know what it is actually. It features a 256 byte serial flash discovery parameter a register that contains information about device configurations, available instructions, and other features. Uh, the SFDP parameters, so I guess this is part of the standardization, maybe? Uh, so I guess that different chips can probably put this where they want in the memory map. They can put it wherever they want, but it has to be 256 bytes. And probably, like what it's mentioning here is... Uh, da, 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 da. It's stored in one or more parameter identification tables. Currently only one PID table is specified. Yeah, so it's a standard. Oh, this is actually really interesting. So this is probably one way of, um, I imagine that the part of the standard is that this command always does this. It would be interesting to go and look that up actually. Um, I won't do it now, but uh, I'm gonna make a mental note to, to take a look into that. So actually we shouldn't write data into that first page anyway, um, unless that data is uh, relevant. Similar to USB device info. Yeah, I think probably it is similar to USB device info. Yeah, that it's like a discoverable standardized piece of information that once you get like in USB, you get the descriptors. And uh, like once you have your descriptor, you can figure out like, oh, okay, it's this class of device. And then you can actually standardly read more information about like the specifics of the device class and everything. Um, although my, my USB knowledge is relatively limited. It's actually mainly limited to the uh, excursions I did with this particular camera um, because on my Mac, um, when, when I was uh, using my Mac, which I use for work, um, I was using this camera and I couldn't get autofocus to work. There's no like way to configure that in Mac. And the uh, there's if you want a program that does that for you, if you go and search like GitHub and stuff, you won't find stuff like at least you won't find things that make sense. Uh, I'm sure they actually, there are things that work there. In fact, I know that there are things that work there, but most of this stuff doesn't make sense. It's kind of crazy. If you go and search on the Mac app store, you have to pay like 10 euros or something to get a program in order to set manual focus, which I think is crazy. Um, so I ended up going down the rabbit hole and kind of like writing a, um, uh, writing a program to um, uh, that that uses libUSB and the libUSB bindings in Node to to actually uh, like control the parameters of the camera from from code, and I had actually I had planned to make a big video about it, and um, yeah, I had this whole like I don't know why I didn't do this in the end. I I just sort of didn't make this video, but I had gone all the way of writing this driver and then I was like, okay, I standardize it. I put it like wrap it up in this package. And then I had this um 
Arduino, like a little Arduino uh, Nano. I got a little uh, flash screen, like a, uh, an LCD screen, a couple of buttons, some potentiometers. And the idea was that I was gonna have a potentiometer to manually adjust focus and everything. And I built this whole project and I had like a secondary driver layer to talk, like to talk to the Arduino for getting the control commands. So I had this whole thing and uh, and I just didn't end up doing it in the end for some reason, but I really should get back to that at some point. Definitely gonna be doing some USB related stuff in the, in the future because I have, and I've had it on my desk for ages and I keep, there's just too many things to do in the world. But uh, the bus pirate is based around this FTDI chip. Well, there's like a more powerful version of this S FTDI chip, um, which is the FT232. Um, and I've got this little breakout board here from uh, from Adafruit. And uh, with this, um, you can actually sort of directly talk to the FTDI chip and directly do things like I2C and SPI. Like you don't need that. You wouldn't even need to go through the bus pirate or something. You can literally just have this one board. I mean, yeah, it's kind of the same thing in the end. Uh, from a hardware perspective, right? You've got an extra device, but but this one is much more direct control, right? There's no microchip involved. It's literally just this FTDI. Uh, well, it's not a microchip in itself, right? You don't program it. You just write code on the computer side, on the host side, and you directly do stuff. And, and actually you can achieve much higher speeds than you can with the bus pirate, and you can achieve like a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I have the idea to eventually um, like, through either through libusb or um or by writing a bespoke uh node extension um to actually get like the ability to run run that like yeah natively uh, in node but that's a long way off and that's uh that's <laughs> i'm sorry i got so sidetracked at this point um yeah so i'm guessing that's what it is i'm guessing it's a descriptor ish uh yeah. All right. So lesson lesson here is we shouldn't write to the zero page. Um, where can we write that's just a like a normal place? Um, yeah. So that's actually just the first two hundred and fifty six bytes. So basically anywhere beyond that is fine. Like even in the first block. Uh, but we could just start at like you know, like up here, you could start a block for 31 or something like that. I think I'm just going to start at the next page. I mean, for us, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, uh, it, it would matter like in a, in a more like embedded system, uh, context, but in this case, it's, uh, it's just us reading and writing for the fun of it to explore the idea of writing a driver. Um, okay. So let's read the file. Uh, let's init the flash. We've do the JDEC thing and let's get the file contents. Uh, so we can do await fs.read file and we're going to pass path.join um, where we are right now with this file. Um, we need to go back one and then we need to go to the package JSON. All right, so that's the file contents. Um, we're gonna start at the next page and let's do it like this. Uh, offset, already breaking things. And what we need to do is now we're gonna, we've got a node buffer and we need to kind of split this up. So what we're gonna do is um, so this is going to be, no, let's call this address. Yeah, let's call it page address. And we will have, let's say a for loop where we get, this is going to be our file offset. It's going to start at zero while the file offset is less than the file contents dot length 
um, file offset plus equals one page, so 256 bytes. Um, and then what we're going to do is we are going to do this. We're going to enable write. We're going to write these bytes to this page address and our send buffer. Well, we're ju actually just going to be sending file contents now. And it's going to be file contents slice because we're only going to send a portion of this buffer. So we're going to start at the file offset and we're going to send maximum the file offset plus 256. And then at the end of this, we also need to increment the page address. So the page address is also going to get one page worth of uh, data. Yeah, if we knew where we were starting, oh, there's probably nicer ways of writing this, but I think this will this will work for now. So, so this will allow us to write beyond multiple pages. And then what we can do is we can read. What I want to know is if we if we do a read, can we read more than one page at a time? I think we might be able to. I think you can actually read further than like the the page that you you write to. So it's going to be a read, 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 read data. You know, I don't even see a it doesn't even make a, a note about it here. It's required for page program. There's no note about read. So what I think happens with read, if I'm correct, is that we simply, um... hey, thanks, Greg. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's also super cool that, uh, I mean, it's, it's less common. People don't do it very much, but it's, it's possible, you know, like the, the limitation is in people's minds, I think, with a lot of this stuff when it comes to TypeScript. It's not necessarily the best uh, language to do these things in. Like, there are smoother paths to it. But I think, like, especially for people who, like, you know, know TypeScript and are web developers and are coming into things wanting to explore the, the hardware side, like, you know, we can, you actually can do this stuff. Um... Yeah, so we can read, I think we can read the entire length back. We can try that. And then, um, then we can validate it, read it back. And then what I want to do is to write it as a string back to the screen. Let's see if this works. I think it should. We'll debug it if it doesn't. And then, if this works, let's actually break out the uh, the the salier and uh, and have a play around with that. Um, all right, let's do a hard reset with that. Okay, so you can only read two hundred and fifty six bytes at once. All right, that's fine. It just means that we need to do a similar kind of thing here. Um, so what we'll do is we'll make an Rx buffer like this and we'll just we'll just start it off empty and we will da, 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 da. yeah we'll just basically do the same thing I'm just gonna copy this code because it's essentially what we need to do um, and so yeah, except that we've, uh, hmm, 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 hmm. I guess we'd actually, we never need to, we never need to modify page address. That's, we can actually get to page address by doing, uh, like page address plus file offset, right? That's the whole point of having an offset. Um, so we don't need to modify that. So we can actually uh, do the same thing here where we will basically just, Once bytes is going to be equal to await read bytes page address plus file offset. We're going to read. 
Now, yeah, this is the, the tricky part. We need to... We need to read like the read bytes. It's going to be like the minimum between either 256 um, or however many bytes we have left. And so that's going to be the file content file contents length. Uh, minus the file offset. Right, I'm doing that math right. This is the whole file plus however far we into it we are into it now. Like whatever's remaining, take the smaller number between these two, uh, and then that's what we should read, I think. All right, and then what we can do is we can just take our Rx buffer and say, yeah, we'll reassign it. Rx buffer equals Rx buffer rather buffer dot concat the existing rx buffer and the bytes that we just got so we'll build up um we'll build up the rx buffer that way then we can validate the uh things and then we can print it to the screen all right let's try it out Yeah, awesome. There we go. The package JSON lives on the spy flash. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, there we go. Cool. I'm really happy with that. Um, yeah, I feel like that's a pretty, pr pretty good place to break out the logic analyzer. I have a ridiculous number of USB devices now going because I've got the webcam, the microphone, my keyboard, my mouse, the bus pirates plugged in and the Salier is about to go in. And for my poor little laptop, that is, you know, that's reaching the edges of what is possible. I've already got two USB hubs plugged in. So uh, yeah, let me show you something pretty cool about these uh, Salier, uh, Salier things. So I recently, I recently got these um, these little clips on AliExpress, and you saw them on the on the uh, uh, attached to the bus pirate device itself. But yeah, these are the these are the clips, and I really would uh, I don't know if this is gonna like improve the quality or not. But these little clips they come out, and you can hook them onto pins and wires and stuff like that. That is not a good background for this. Let's see if this works any better. I'm just picking really bad uh, backgrounds. Anyway, that's the that's one clip that I got from AliExpress. Now, this the Salier device comes with a bunch of these little clips as well, but the like the scale of these things is crazy, crazy different. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try the best I can with this, but. So I'm going to poke that out, and then I want to show you the Salier one. You probably can't even see that. It's so tiny in comparison. So this thing can grab on to something like that. It's crazy. You can grab right onto the, the leads of a microcontroller if it's like not too fine of a pitch. It's, um, it's so cool. The I think I'm going to be a... Uh, I think I'm going to be like an enormous advocate for this company, Salier, because like one, they were so fast with this whole discount thing. And they were so like, it was such a straightforward process. And uh, like when I open this thing up, like the quality level is incredible. I'm, I swear to God, I'm not being paid for this. Like I'm not like, uh, like I haven't used it yet, so it could be terrible. <laughs> But like the quality level of this thing, like they really didn't like, they they don't uh, they don't skimp out on the quality. Let's say that. Um, all right. So the idea is going to be to take this tiny little cute little device, which I opened up by the way, and it's got such a also such a beautiful circuit board inside. It's uh, you can find images on the internet, but really beautiful little thing. We're going to take that. 
And then this is like the wire harness that comes with it. So you can just jam this uh, directly in and it has eight channels. So they do a 16 channel version of this as well, but then the price is really like out of my, like out of my range, even with any discounts that might be applied. <laughs> so, um, so it's got eight channels. We only really need to use probably three, right? Because we, we can watch the, um, like, the one the thing we're interested in debugging here is seeing what the bus pirate is sending so we can actually just watch the um the data out signal of the bus pirate we can watch the um the chip select and the clock and i think that's going to give us a lot of useful information and what we'll see is that the salier thing can actually uh, just um directly decode spy which is awesome as well uh, i haven't tried it yet but should be able to do it so all right let me hook this up i've got to do a little bit more wiring now so it's going to take me a minute but uh bear with me hi m question mark uh we're we're writing a uh, spi driver for a spi flash chip using the bus pirate <laughs> which is a hardware hacking sort of Swiss army knife. Um, and we're doing all of it in TypeScript. So there's a whole driver stack that we're building up now with a bottom layer in uh, bus pirate and the next layer up being the actual spy protocol. And then finally the specific driver for the flash chip. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. All right. So getting the test clips on, it's pretty fiddly you end up with something like this. So it's connected in, it clips onto this little wire and then you've got your spring loaded clip there. So I'm gonna make pin one, um, I'm gonna make pin one the clock. I think that's a good, good pin one. All right, then pin two is gonna be the data line. So that's going to be the data in to the chip because it's what we're sending from the bus pirate. And then pin three is going to be our chip select, which says that the pirate, uh, the, the flash chip should be listening on the bus. And even getting these clips on is fiddly process all right and then finally let's watch is that all we need to watch yeah and then you need to ground every signal right every signal needs a ground reference point and these are all the same ground reference point and i think the sanest thing to do here is going to be to grab a breadboard I'm sorry that you can't see any of this. I will get a second camera at some point. Uh, grab a breadboard and just plug one ground connection from the one ground connection from the bus pirate, and then just do everything from that one connection. So, how I will do this is never had the right wire available in the moment I need it. I'm going to use a red wire for my ground connection, which is really bad. All right, so that's ground there. Again, I apologize for this. And that's that. Um, so the actual signal is going to get its uh, thing, and then I will plug a little pin header in I've got some of these like loose pin headers here I'm just going to plug those into the breadboard and that's too many it's one too many clip one of these off All right, so now I can actually just uh, plug these th 
three cables, three ground signals onto those. Yeah, okay, preparation is done, I think. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. I know that this is not the world's most riveting watch. Um, all right, then, like, oh my God, my desk is an absolute mess of cables. All right, so plugging in the device. Yeah. It's a real rat's nest here now. So uh, I have the Salier software open here. So I'm I'm going to open that up here and you should see it. Um, yeah, so this is pretty cool, right? Uh, I actually think this is written in Electron. If I look at this icon, this looks to me like they've written this program in Electron, which is amazing. All right, so we're going to select three digital channels here. And we can actually sample at quite a fast speed. Um, I don't think we're going to need more than this 25, so I'll leave it on that. So we've got these three channels. You can also do analog measurement, which is amazing. Like we could actually measure these three changes. Um, the sample rate changes when you add, um, like as you add channels. So like if I had all of these um in and we were looking like we wouldn't actually be able to go up to these higher values that we saw before but if i take some channels out that we could actually go up to 100 uh, million samples per second uh or is it mega sample million sample i'm not ex exactly sure but i think it's million sample and yeah we're saying that we've got a maximum buffer size of three gigabytes which is quite a lot of data um you can really collect a lot here uh yeah, let's actually try this out. I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to like set uh, in the code. Let's come over here and add a delay. Do I have a delay in function here? Let's add a delay function. I'm going to delay for some number of milliseconds. And that's going to be new promise. So set timeout uh, to resolve after milliseconds, and we'll just say this returns void, and then we've got ourselves a nice delay function. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here and um, just await a delay of like five seconds. And then that's just going to give us time to zip back over and press the press the button on the Salier device. Maybe I'm going to give myself six seconds here because I have to change window and everything. So um, let's try this out. I'm going to run this. Then we're going to have six seconds to zip back to the Salier and uh, um, try that out. So going over, pressing play. And what we should see is some stuff happening. Yes. All right, that was it. That can't have been it, right? That can't have been all of the the messages. Um, I think I must have uh, stopped it early there because this is only this is probably only the JDEC. Uh, well, maybe not. All right. So what we're seeing here, right, is the waveforms of um, of the spy bus. So this channel zero. What did I say? Channel zero was. It's the uh, uh, data in so that's going to be mosey and then channel two is going to be probably the clock i think what did i make channel one the clock okay no channel one is the clock channel two is mosey and channel three is cs and yeah, so let's actually zoom in a bit here. So what we're gonna see is, like you can see here is when we're actually enabling the device and then uh, like it's active, active low enabled, which means while the line is high, um, it's, it's like 
disabled. And then it's, when we pull it down to the low position, that's when it's actually active. So what you can see here is we pull it low and then somewhere in there, there is some spy transfer. And like the, you can get a sense of the timing here, right? Like the difference between the electrical timing and like the timing in node. So this is 31 milliseconds. And then if we zoom in on this spy transfer, like here we're looking at two, like a, a clock period here or a, the MOSI data here. This is active for uh, 2.48 microseconds, which is pretty tiny. And the clock is actually active, uh, you know, for like 500 nanoseconds at a time. So yeah, it's it goes, goes pretty fast. Um, all right, so that's like one burst of data. So yeah, we could try and manually uh, decode this, but I don't think that's gonna be the most productive. It's just nice to, wow, it's really, uh, it's a little bit difficult to get like, uh, I can't really, oh, okay, click and drag. All right, so then we've got another bunch of data being sent here. And I think, what will be nice is to actually uh, like if we go here into analyzers, we can say that it's SPI. And then we know MOSI is our MOSI signal. We don't have a meso signal. Clock signal is clock and enable is CS. And I, I'm going to need to go and check the spy settings, but I think most significant for bit first is true. 8 bits per bit uh, 8 bits per transfer is also true clock is low when inactive um, I need to check but I think these are all the standards so let's actually save that and we can see here that we end up transferring uh, let's have a look at this let's see how this like what we're doing here so that's the JDEC part so do we see the enable happening? I'm wondering if uh, if we're gonna see this um, chip enabled stuff. So we see nine F, that's the JDEC. And then we put a zero out, zero, zero. Um, so for some reason we didn't capture the, uh... oh, I know why we didn't capture the enable part. It's because um, I put the delay after initialization. So we're not gonna see those first uh, first bytes. But here we're sending the request out. We should actually just hook up another line for the, uh, to see the, uh, the, the meso signal. Why not? All right, so I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna hook up the chips data out signal. Subordinate out. Um, and then I need to hook that up to ground. Yeah, because it would be nice to see the responses. I think this is like a logic analyzer is just the absolute perfect tool for this. All right, so let's go back to the device settings. Let's add one more channel. This one is gonna be Miso. Um, yeah, and then we can go over here to the protocol. Uh, for Spy, how do we change the settings? Edit, uh, Miso is... Miso, save. Okay, and then what we might want to do is actually run this whole thing again so we can recapture some, some data. Uh, so I'm going to reset the bus pirate. And let's go back to the node script. Let's put the delay before uh, we initialize the chip because that way we will actually um, we'll be able to see those reset packets as well. Okay, and so, all right, I think we're ready. Run the script, zip back over as quick as possible. Press play, start capturing. Yeah, and the data is zipping across and that's it. All right, so let's try to 
I think we captured a lot more data than we actually needed to. Because, like, it's all concentrated here in this nice middle part. But uh, what do we see here, actually? Here is actually every transfer, its duration, if I bring that out. Oh, that's really cool. We can actually see the data that came back across the line. It literally decodes it all for you. This is so cool. So you can export this to a CSV file or just on the clipboard. Okay, if I put it on the clipboard, what, what do I see in the, is it back to node? Oh, look at that. That's so cool. So is it showing us data? It's only showing us the data, I think. It's only showing us the actual spy data that happened. So we're seeing the uh, the type of uh, signal, the start time, the duration. This is going to be in um, probably in microseconds. And we'll see what what was on the Mosey line and what was on the Meso. And yeah, that's going to depend on what kind of uh, thing is if we have a result or if we have a yeah, because we get enables, disables, and results. Oh, that's so cool. So you can use, like, and this is something I'm thinking about doing as well in the future. In the table on the right. I think uh, I missed probably what the specific question was there, uh, Greg. But yeah, this is so cool. So cool. I have an idea um, for something that I think would be really cool to do, which would be to like write some code for like uh, an Arduino that controls some sort of like high level SPI or I2C device. So like something that's doing something, I don't know, like temperature monitoring or like something that's maybe doing something even more complicated like uh i don't know we should probably start small um so basically write some arduino code which is going to use like super quote unquote high level libraries compared to the what we're doing here so you're going to have like you know a very high level interface where you describe what you're doing and 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 what we can do is we can use that as a black box and we can grab the logic analyzer. We can put these on the lines of the um, of the spy bus or the I2C bus, and we can try to reverse engineer the protocols of the device by just observing the traffic and and checking them out here in the in the um, in the logic analyzer. I think that would be such a fun uh, project to do. Like probably good uh, good format for streams as well. But, oh, this is incredible. Like, I'm already so impressed. Um, yeah, so these are the, we get this whole um, trigger view. So what's this all about? Experimental partial match your query against a single analyzer result. Oh, that's cool. So if we were searching for a particular value and we can talk about the hold off, so like, you probably what you can do is you can say I put us like you put a command byte in here like if we put in like I don't know some read thing and then we say that we think it's going to take like I don't know at least 200 milliseconds to come through what you're basically doing is saying don't don't capture until you hit this trigger I think that's also pretty cool oh look at that yeah maybe this is what you were talking about Greg you can actually just dump the data directly like super awesome and the slash separates the um the send and receive so you just get yeah if you just want the data super easy to get it this way right so we also get timing markers okay so how do they work so if i add a time marker oh yeah that's cool so we can just like if we wanted to measure like some arbitrary distance between two things like we can take the marker and like add another one add marker pair that's interesting so if i was to put this one and then this one 
This gives us like the delta between them. It also gives us like what that delta would be uh, like if we thought about it in terms of frequency, which is quite a useful thing to do if you're dealing with these uh, electrical signals. All right, super cool. I'm like a kid in a candy store with this. And yeah, there's all kinds of like, uh, I see that there are all kinds of um, things you can install, kind of uh, extensions and everything. And I saw that they have an SDK that you can also write your own. Um, digital measurement for a duty cycle. Yeah, this is awesome. All right, so let's have a look. Let's see if we can just like map the whole journey out. Um, so in the beginning, we're probably going to be restarting the device. So I think that these are going to be, there's our 66. That's our like enable reset. And then what feels like an eternity later, but is actually just 50, 52 milliseconds, <laughs> 52 milliseconds later, we begin the actual reset. It's, it's pretty cool here to see like the, uh, like essentially see the execution speed of the language, like what you would normally think of as a super fast thing happening in a programming language, like how that just gets blown out of the water when you come to electronics. And this is like, this is slow speed stuff in electronics. Like this is going, like this isn't fast. And ah, that's what we actually need to check. We need to check what happens when we do this other, um, use this other bus pirate API. Um, all right, so then we see the 99, that's gonna be our um, reset signal. And then about 40 milliseconds later, we begin our JDEC request, which we get our response here. We get EF4017, very cool, very cool. It's so funny, like, uh, the beginning and the end of a request like this is like when we uh like when we disable our thing and this is when we start so in terms of like latency within node like we're looking at at least 10 milliseconds of latency before like like we're executing like the next thing or at least it moves all the way through because like the serial port library also has to like buffer things up send it flush it it has to actually be received on the bus pirate but yeah, I think 10 milliseconds looks like a, like it's probably like a reasonable-ish time. So that's the JDEC. Then we have next up uh, a six. And what is the six again? That is the beginning of our write enable. So that is uh, setting up write enable. Um, then when we did write enable 50 milliseconds later, we actually start sending data. So we send two, which, yeah, two is the beginning of a page write. And then we send zero, one, and you can see how the, oh, we're sending zero again. Okay, this is, oh, we're sending the address at this point. Yeah, so the address is 0107B. Oh yeah, I'm thinking that we're, I'm, I'm still in the mode where we're sending 01234, but we're actually sending the package JSON at this point. So this is 7B. Um, yeah, what is 7B? I'm not actually sure. But 20 is new line, for instance. Yeah, uh, basically at this point we're sending the package JSON. Um, so we can only send 16 bytes at a time. Oh, oh, so what do we have here? It's uh, the bus pirate. The bus pirate's bulk transfer is 16 bytes at a time. This is actually uh, like kind of the limit limiting factor. Cause you see here, like we send some data, 16 bytes, then there's like a full 20 milliseconds, crazy 20 milliseconds. But yeah, on the, on the order of like the, um, like the clock signal here, right? We see what the clock is running at. Like we're looking at, uh, a microsecond 
Um, and a microsecond, yeah, is uh, is one megahertz, which is the clock speed we're running at, which is super slow. Um, so we're sending that. And what, what I think we're going to see in the end, by the way, is that when the bus pirate sends this, it's just blasting this data out at like a crazy rate. And I think this just this device can't keep up with it. That's my my working theory. It's also an interesting pattern. We send some data, then there's like a longer period of time. Then we're able to send two bits of data relatively fast, like with only eight milliseconds. And then there's another gap of like 20 milliseconds. And then we can send another two bursts. And that's not going to be that's probably not going to be the bus pirate or maybe it is the bus pirate maybe it's the bus pirate's uh, limiting factor there i'm not sure but it it could equally be node uh yeah so we're sending a bunch of data at this point and we're just each time we're sending 16 bytes and you can see we end up sending a lot of bytes here the entire package json and then here this is when we start reading it back and so those point are all zeros, and then here's where we get back the first 7b. OXA, 20, yeah, and that's our response. So that is the package JSON right there on the spy bus. Well, not the whole thing, like the beginning of uh, sending it. That's it. Incredible. What, a, what an awesome tool this is. Like, so many, uh, are the gaps abnormally large? I'm not sure if they're abnormally large. That's the that's the thing. I've never had such a view on this whole situation before because even my oscilloscope, I only have two channels. So I can never actually really observe. I mean, I could observe like one of the data lines in the clock, but I can never observe this whole picture um, up until this point. So I'm not sure if it's abnormally large. I think it's just in comparison, like, uh, there's two things it could be, right? It could be that Node like has some event loop stuff that's happening, which means it's got some sort of like predictable delays going on. But maybe what's more likely is that the bus pirate, which is taking in data, buffering it up inside into an internal buffer and then sending it out as fast as it can. Um, it may be the case that the bus pirate is like going slow, but the bus pirate is able to reach much faster speeds than this. Um, although what it, where it's faster is actually sending these bursts of data. So it might be the case that like between each burst of data, like it has to do some processing work and that's maybe why we see something like this, but I'm not really sure. It's definitely interesting. Let's put those back up before I forget them. All right, uh, as a final thing, um, as a final thing, maybe we could really quickly just take a look and just like run, like use the bus pirate API. Uh, so what I've been using internally is uh, there is this high level, high level API for transferring on the spy bus. So we have the lowest level API for the spy bus is transfer, send one byte, receive one at the same time. Then the bus pirate has this write them read, which I implemented but didn't work last time. So I ended up writing a custom version of write them read, which has the same interface, right? That we pass a command, we pass some data, and then we have a number of bytes we want to read. And I built that on top of transfer. So write them read just um, uh, basically. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I guess uh, hmm, I actually thought this was, oh, transfer actually, I made transfer do all of the hard work of like splitting up the bytes and everything. So transfer is, uh, it can take an arbitrary amount of data, <coughs> but it has to chop it up into 16 byte uh, increments. And then write them read builds on top of that. But the bus pirate write them read, that's actually a, um, that's actually a separate API. And what I want to do is I want to just come up here to the driver uh, driver class and wherever we're using write them read, I just want to switch it for the bus pirate write them read. Um, and I think what we're going to see pretty quickly 
So when we do write bytes, we actually do a transfer. Yeah, that doesn't help us too much. But at least when we're reading it back, we're going to see it. <coughs> so I'm really interested to see what happens on the bus at this point. I'm going to get the command ready, pull the device out, plug it back in, run the command, zip back to the logic analyzer, start recording the data. And probably what we're going to see is it crashing. Let's stop we're way over the mark. All right, so yeah, this is where we were trying to read it back, I think. Um, let's see, let's make sure node actually did crash there. It did. We, um, we timed out waiting for one byte to be available. So basically we thought that, well, the bus pirate said that we should get some data back, but we never did. So if we go to the here, so this is the, this is our write stage. So this is us writing stuff to the device. Everything is great at this point. We're still seeing that like 10 millisecond, 20 millisecond uh, kind of pattern building up here. And then at some moment, probably here, we initiate the read. And that was a four. And we do a six. That's kind of weird on its own, right? I guess. I wonder, are we going to see... Like, this is still a one megahertz clock. Zero, two. Just checking again. Zero, two is our page program. So at this point, we're still writing data. So is it the case then that the bus pirate never actually like begins these reads? Like what is this? Zero four. This this zero four, that is the that's right disable. So actually it looks like the bus pirate just never never sends any data. It just doesn't do it. Well, I mean, that's that's kind of the mystery, <laughs> mystery solved there. Uh, the reason we weren't getting data is not because it was sending too fast or too anything. It just didn't send it. Um, yeah, I mean, at least that makes sense. Uh, kind of anticlimactic. But, uh, but yeah. Hey, Max. Yeah. Oh, Max, while you're here, I want to say a big thank you because it's because of you that I was able to get the uh, the logic analyzer. I mean, I thought it was, honestly, I thought it was like out of price range and uh, like I'd always dreamed, you know, I'd like looked at the Salier website a bunch and I was like, yeah, I would love to have one of these, but uh, it's kind of like not in my wheelhouse. Um, but yeah, I applied for the discount. They sent me the discount. They got back to me super quickly. I can't say enough good things about Salier at this point. Uh, to answer the question of which logic analyzer I'm using, it's a Logic 8 from Salier. Um, yeah, and the software is Logic 2 um, from Salier, which it looks like was built in Electron, which is, you know, pretty cool in itself. Um, yeah, I think that's going to have to conclude it for now. I mean, like, we still have a mystery of why the bus pirate doesn't send the data, but at, th at this point, at least it's clear why it wasn't working last time. So pretty happy with this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've never seen it on the... I hadn't seen it on Reddit, so, I mean, my appreciation goes to you and by proxy Reddit, I guess. Uh, yeah like thanks for watching everyone uh, and uh, yeah I hope you have a really great weekend and uh, yeah if you're a patron of the channel thank you very much because your your funds went to purchasing this device and I hope that we can uh, get a lot of good material out of it got a lot of nice plans for more hardware projects more like super low level stuff to do um, I'm really, really interested in doing some wireless transmit stuff um, because, 
you know, there are a bunch of readily available wireless transmitters these days uh, that run on SPI. And uh, yeah, I think it could be pretty cool. I was also looking at the other day, now I'm just on this bend, I'm, I went to look for like a motor driver controller. Um, so like an I2C uh, uh, servo motor, uh, servo motor controller. So basically we can like build like a little robot or something. I don't know, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to think of all the things. The limitation is mainly that the bus pirate can only, um, can only like talk to one device at a time and we can't, like we can only do one thing. So we can only really speak SPI or we can only do PWM generation. So yeah, there's a limitation there, but I think it's like such a great tool to be able to just explore. And uh, yeah. So again, thanks for joining. I hope you have a great weekend, everyone. And, uh, and I'll see you next time.